Good morning and hello. It is Friday, October 8th. I'm Kenny Polkari, your host of the party. And here is today's morning market commentary, right? Yesterday, the GOP announced that they're going to play nice in the sandbox with the Democrats. The debt ceiling crisis has been averted for now. Keep your eyes on December 3rd because that's the new day to watch. Stocks rallied in this sigh of relief. But all eyes are on today's NFP report, which is coming out in moments. And what are we having for dinner tonight? We're going to try the spaghetti and a butternut squash sauce. It's another great fall dish. It's also a great Thanksgiving dish. So put it on your list of things to potentially cook. Look, investors loved the headline yesterday, right? Mitchie and Chucky getting all cozy as Mitchie offered up an olive branch, offering to suspend the debt ceiling for two more months thereby preventing the catastrophic default that they've all been screaming about and giving Democrats time to figure out what's next, right? So we've, we, the GOP has allowed them to, uh, to take a breath, right? Because they were all getting so worked up and uptight. Stocks did end the day higher, but not on their highs as concerns over the U.S. debt uh, ceiling eased. But stocks did back off a bit when more of the GOP senators did express some frustration with Mitch uh, and then China announced that they plan on tightening their grip on tech companies even more than they currently have their grip on them. So that caused stocks just to kind of back off a bit, right? Um, uh, but it was still an overall good day, right? In the end, the temporary deal that we have should help to calm the markets because it just takes one of the many issues off the table for now. Uh, and like I said, December 3rd is going to be the day to watch. So mark your calendars because this conversation, while it may be over for today, it's not going to be over uh, in the long term. As the bell rang, the Dow added 338 points of 1%. The S&P was up 8 tenths of a percent. The NASDAQ gained 1% or 150 points. The so Russell is up 1.6%. While the trend splits actually gave back 38 points or fell by 3 tenths of a percent. But that's okay because the other day trend splits outperformed. So it's just a little bit of back and forth. Now look, while I believe that there was never going to be a default at all, I will say that the Dems did a good job of creating an Armageddon-like atmosphere. And then Joey topped it off when he took to the podium on Wednesday to tell us that our retirement savings could be on the verge of being wiped out. And Janet Yellen used words like catastrophe, disaster, fiasco, devastation. A bit dramatic, don't you think? I mean, I'm surprised she didn't use cataclysmic. In any event, there wasn't ever any real danger at all. But Washington is all about the drama. I would, though, like to know whose idea it was to have Joey say that. Because I have to believe that he knows that was not true at all. When you think of countries defaulting on, on their debt, you think of Venezuela, Argentina, Russia, and a host of others. You do not think of the United States, and for good reason. Because it would never happen. I don't know how many times I have to say that. It would never happen. Anybody who thinks it does needs their head examined. Look. If we didn't lose everything during the most recent real Armageddon in the markets, think the great financial crisis of 2007 to 2009 that enveloped the globe, then this supposed debt crisis is nothing but a pimple on your ass. Remember, it took two years for the market to lose 60% of its value, not two days. So I'm just putting it in perspective, right? It was a, it's a little bit overblown, but again, it's all about the drama. Uh, yesterday, I was on Charles Payne on Fox Business at 2.15, and we discussed his very point, right? We discussed the language and the drama and the delivery and, and, the, and, the, and the chaotic atmosphere that it was all creating when uh, you use such inflammatory words like that, and then you threaten, you know, um, the, 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 the life savings of a lot of people to be wiped away just in a flash of a pen like that. It's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Everyone in Washington should be ashamed of themselves, but either way. The ego data was a bit better than expected yesterday, but that did little to add the excitement because the speculation is all about today's NFP report um, and what it's going to show, uh, what it's going to show investors, right? My sense is that it's going to be a little bit stronger number than expected, just like we saw with ADP on Wednesday, partly because the September number was so weak. Unemployment is expected to drop to 5.1% down from 5.2%. Average hourly earnings are expected to be up and the underemployment rate should approach closer to 8%. Overall, it should be a bit of a warmer number, but not so hot that it causes the Fed to have to reposition itself yet again. Because I think that's the next issue that's on everyone's mind, right? Every sector except utilities, which fell by a half a percent, ended the day stronger. Consumer discretionary, the XLY, led the way up, gaining 1.6%. And that's curious because that speaks directly to the health of the consumer. Names like Bloomies and Nordstrom's and Tiffany's and Michael Kors and Jared Diamonds. 
Because discretionary purchases are just that, discretionary. They are not the consumer staples, the XLP, which only gained four tenths of a percent. So you think toothpaste, soap, diapers, paper towels, aspirin, shampoo, uh, starch for your shirts, Q-tips, cereals, and oatmeal. You get the picture, right? Procter & Gamble, Colgate, Kellogg, TJ Maxx, Kohl's, to name just a few. Healthcare, XLV, and basic materials gained 1.3%. Tech was up 9 tenths of a percent. The industrials up 8 tenths of a percent. Financials and energy up 7 tenths of a percent, right? So overall, it was a better day. The 10-year treasury ended the day yielding 1.58, which was up and is now approaching 1.6%, which also means it's approaching the February highs of 1.77%. And that should prove to offer some resistance, at least temporarily for stocks, right? Remember, the bet is that yields are going to end the year at 1.8%. The VIX fell by 7% yesterday. Naturally, as the market rallied, the VIX falls. Gold fell by $4. Oil gained 70 cents to end the day at $79 a barrel again. And this morning, it's trading right there, right? So as I said, in the end, everybody just breathed a bit of a sigh of relief. This morning, we wake up to a little bit more excitement. China reopened after having been closed since Monday for the Golden Week holiday. And stocks there advanced by 1.3% as they played catch-up. The Chinese PMI data did rise to 53.4, up from 46.7. And that's a spectacular rise in that data point because it puts China back in expansion mode. Recall, sub-50 means you're in contraction mode. Not good. Apparently, no one also in China appears to be concerned at all about Evergrande or the Chinese property developers that are choking under massive debt. In fact, I don't even think anyone's talked about Evergrande in more than a week. And now, and, and they've already missed three bond payments. How many more are they going to miss? So much for that Lehman-type moment that really would have wiped out your retirement savings. So I think, I think Joey and some of his advisors need to understand uh, the economy and actually how they use the words to describe where we're in because we're nowhere near that. And your markets were a little bit, little bit lower this morning after the back and forth action all week, right? Monday was down, Tuesday was up, Wednesday was flat, Thursday was up, and now this morning it, uh, markets are down there, right? As investors there are also uh, awaiting our non-farm payroll report. And in other news, Ireland, that has been the holdout to reforming the global corporate tax rules, has now decided to join in the fund agreeing to let go of its 12.5% tax rate and opt for the 15% rate that 140 other countries have agreed to, just as these nations are all getting together, by the way, in meeting today. In the end, it is a way of taxing big international companies so that everyone gets their fair share. If they all sign this document, it would represent the most sweeping changes to international taxation in more than 100 years. And if successful, the new plan would begin in 2023. In economic news, Germany's trade balance for August came in at 13 billion euros versus the estimate of 15.8 billion euros. But while that sounds important, it's doing absolutely nothing for today's tone. Uh, at 5.30 this morning when I was writing this, the markets across the region were flat to down about a half a percent, right? So there wasn't a whole lot of excitement. And U.S. futures, well, there were no fireworks there right now either. And this was earlier. Futures are essentially flat, right? They're, they're down, but not anything to really write home about since they've turned up slightly. But again, nothing to really write home about. Um, as we wait, right? It's only going to be minutes away until we get the uh, the non-farm payroll report to see which way we're going now. The story really remains the same. Investors are waiting on this report. And the report should offer more clarity, at least we hope, on what investors think the Fed is going to do at the November meeting, which is one month away. It's actually November 2nd and 3rd to be exact, so it's under a month. In addition, we have the official start of earnings season next week, and when the big banks kick in, uh, J.P. Morgan, Citibank, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, um, and BlackRock. And, uh, and while BlackRock is not a bank, they are a massive global money manager with more than $9 trillion of assets under management. I suspect that on the call next week, they're going to report an increase in assets under management that is going to take them over the $10 trillion mark. Uh, NFP report just came out. I see unemployment dropped to 4.8%, and average hourly earnings are up better than expected. Uh, 194,000 jobs, though, were added in September, which was less than the number. Now, so I just said, if today's report is strong, then you expect the tapering conversations to gain steam. If it's warm, then the Fed could go either way. And if it's cold, meaning another weak report, then that could give Jay Powell cover to do nothing and keep buying $120 billion in bonds every month. 
We'll see what happens. I have to. I have to go now and look at look at what this news. Right, the yield is now ten year yield is out one point five seven percent. And just for fun, Jay is up for reappointment. And there is some question about his tenure. We know that Lizzie Warren has already made it clear that he's a dangerous man. Her words, not mine, and will not support his reappointment. So then you have to ask. Will that cause the next uproar in the financial markets, or is that just their way of making noise and stamping her feet uh, the way so many elected officials do to get their way? It's going to be interesting to see what they must give her to get her support, the way I'd like to know what the Dems gave the GOP last night to get them to come to the other side of the fence as well. Now, don't kid yourself. Somebody got something. They always do. I guess you have to ask, what are, what are they going to give Manchin and Cinema in order to get them to fall in line with the rest of the Democrats, because right now they're the ones that are standing in the way of the big 3.5 tr uh, trillion. Listen, Bitcoin, which had a nice run this week, is trading at 55,400, Ethereum's at 3,650. The S&P ended the day yesterday at 43.99 after trading as high as 44.29, ending solidly above the trend line at 43.55. Today is gonna be key to watch. What will investors glean from the NFP report? Will we move significantly higher or just churn right here? Futures action and European moves do not suggest anything dramatic at all just yet. But it's still, uh, uh, the sun has just made its way up. Uh, the world is, the U.S. is just waking up. Uh, and so my gut tells me that the number was going to be warm. I think that's what it is. But again, it came out while I was doing this. So I have to go back and look at it, right? And that should help stabilize the markets, right? Uh, and, and it also feels like everyone's getting much more comfortable with the start of tapering. Not the start of rising rates, but the start of tapering. And Jay's made it very clear that the two events are mutually exclusive. And if investors do not believe that, then watch as the market reprices, right? But I don't think that happens, at least not today. Uh, and I do think that Jay is right. I think they are mutually exclusive. So anyway, uh, I do expect uh, the recent volatility to subside. I do not expect the reason volatility to subside anytime soon, and I expect more turbulence in the weeks ahead, especially as we start earnings season. Remember, uh, the devil is going to be in the details. Future guidance, input prices, rising dollars, supply chain issues, and how the future Fed policy may help or harm all or any of these projections. So you need to stay close to your desk. This is not the time to take a nap. Remember, you can text the word INVEST to 21000 on your cell phone to get my digital business card. It'll be downloaded right to your phone. You get all my information. Feel free to email me, text me, call me, whatever. I'm always happy to talk about um, markets, planning, pricing, concerns, issues, anything, uh, anything you want to talk about. I'm always happy to engage. Uh, and you know you can always follow me on Twitter and TikTok, at Kenny Polkari. Uh, you can get me on my Instagram, which is at Kenny P. 1961. So what are we having for dinner tonight? So I said, this is a great fall dish, for, especially for those of you who live in the, uh, in the Northeast or the Upper Northwest, right? Spaghetti with a butternut squash sauce is simple to make, right? So you first want to bring a pot of salted water to a rolling boil and then turn it to simmer until you need it. Just leave it on the back burner so it's ready to go when you're ready to boil the pasta, right? In another pot, you, you need cubed butternut squash. You got to take two thirds of the amount you have and put it in the put it in the pot with chicken stock. You want to put some crushed garlic in there, and you want to put a stick of butter. Right? Don't add too much salt, as the stock could be salty enough. So bring it to make the sauce first, and then taste it because you can always add sauce. Right? You want to just add enough stock to cover the squash. Right? You want it to be kind of bathing in the in the uh, in the in the stock. Right? Because once you crush up the butternut squash, you want it to be a thick sauce. Right? You want to boil that until the squash is soft. And then you're going to use a masher or one of those handheld puree utensils. You could put it in the blender as well to mash the squash. Once that's done uh, and it's nice and thick, you want to add the remaining third of the cubed squash that you did not use and let it simmer for 15 or 20 minutes just to get it to cook nicely because you want chunks of the, of, um, of the squash in the, in the pasta, right? Now, uh, to, when that's done, you want to turn that heat off. Uh, add, a, add two handfuls of shredded Parmigiana cheese, mix well and just let it sit there. Now add the pasta to the pot of water that you've got ready. Let it cook for eight to 10 minutes. You want it al dente, strain the pasta, you know, always reserving a mug full of water just to re-moisten the pasta, right? So put the pasta back in the pot, add a little bit of the water just to make it moist. Do not make it watery. Just, you want to just moisten it a little bit. Now, mix it with the butternut squash. Serve immediately in warm bowls. You can always have more Parmigiana cheese on the table for your guests. 
uh, because it's it, you can never have enough cheese. You know how I feel about that. Listen, it's Friday. The weekend's here. The day has just begun. The NFP report is out. Futures are still mixed, right? There's been no real reaction. They popped up, and now they're kind of mixed, and uh, Dow and S&Ps are a little bit lower. Like NASDAQ, if I saw it, uh, was, just, uh, was just on the plus side. In any event, have a great weekend, and until Monday, take good care.